Well, welcome to a session on which cliche should we use, the graveyard of empires, America's longest war, uh, anything worse? Uh, in any case, uh, we're fortunate to have Steve Call to talk about his uh, recent book on the subject. Since it's uh, over 700 pages, I'm afraid you will only get the Reader's Digest version today. Uh, after which we'll also hear from uh, some people with uh, ample experience uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, you won't hear from me since my total exposure to Afghanistan was, what, about 10 days in 2011? Uh, in any case, uh, Steve Call is Dean of the School of Journalism uh, and a staff writer at The New Yorker. He's the author of eight books. Uh, two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize, as well as other awards. Uh, he was a reporter and foreign, car car foreign correspondent and senior editor at the Washington Post covering Wall Street uh, and was uh, the paper's South Asia correspondent. He was managing editor of the Post. I won't list all his books, um, but uh, Steve, Thank I've you. No, thanks. So I think I'll go over here just for a few minutes. All right. The idea is for maybe me to talk for about 20 minutes, and then I'm really looking forward to including Steve and, and, um, in the, and, and Philippe in the conversation. Um, I um, wonder how many of you have read this book. Not many. <laughs> well, Barney, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm not surprised. So, uh, and had any of you read the, the sort of predecessor book, Ghost Wars? Yeah, a little bit, okay. All right, so, um, just to set the context for what I'm gonna talk about in my brief time and just try to draw out some of the central themes that are in this narrative. It's a, it's, you know, it's a very um, th a th thorough, but I hope readable history. Ghost Wars um, starts with the Soviet, and roughly with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, and comes forward through September 10th, 2001, and it's an attempt to describe for American, Afghan, and Pakistani audiences some of the origins of the September 11th attacks as they were located in a couple of decades of U.S. covert and overt uh, policies in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So the, the book is sort of set in the triangle of Washington, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, and um, it came out in 2004, and it ended up, um, you know, having a wider readership than I certainly would have predicted. And there was always the question of whether I should do a second uh, volume after the U.S. Uh, invaded Afghanistan in 2001, and then um, uh, continued to try to stabilize the country uh, by 2009 uh, with uh, increasing numbers of combat troops, peak was about 140,000 international combat troops fighting in Afghanistan circa 2010, 2011. And so that's what Directorate S is. It is a, it's intended as a second volume of Ghost Wars. It starts where Ghost Wars ends on the eve of 9-11 and it comes forward to roughly 2016, something like the present day. And it, it's set in that same triangle of Washington, Pakistan, and Afghanistan and attempts to describe um, why the United States and NATO essentially failed to achieve their goals across this very long uh, conflict uh, and, and even in some instances failed to define their goals, uh, which was another reason why they didn't achieve them. Um, and so um, there are lots of characters and lots of episodes and narratives, but in my time what I thought I would do is pull out uh, several of what I think are the recurring themes in this history. You know, you, many of you have written books, you know, you kind of don't even understand what the themes of your book are until you have to go out and talk about it after you've written it. Mostly you're just trying to get the thing down on paper and, and have it work on the page. But um, I, I, as I went back over the finished book to try to see where, where, the, rep where the larger uh, repetitive themes were, um, the first one was, and, and really I'm choosing these themes to try to address the question, why did the United States and NATO fail to achieve their goals in this conflict? Um, there are lots of other questions you could ask about the book and the war, but, but th th that's the question I want to use these themes to address. The first is um, 
as I mentioned, the problem of, of war aims. It was sort of a writer's problem that in describing a number of classified interagency reviews that took place um, in Washington, usually in the same secure conference room of the Eisenhower Executive Office building next to the West Wing, or sometimes moving down into the Situation Room as it moved up the chain of command, that the analysts and the deputies and the principals who came in to wrestle over the war from time to time, starting roughly 2006 and then at intervals right through to the summer of 2017, uh, a problem for the writer was that the repetition of these debates uh, was continuous, that they would raise the same questions, hear the same intelligence briefings, look at the same stalemated map of the war, uh, often unfurled by uh, CIA analysts with these bright colors and, and high degrees of classification, but the, the map really didn't change starting around 2007. And one of the, the problems that was repetitious was one that is elemental for citizens who have been watching this war from a distance. Why are we there? What vital interests justify the sacrifice of blood and treasure that this war is exacting? What vital interests, truly vital interests, justify asking young American men and women to perhaps make the ultimate sacrifice on the Afghan battlefield? And again and again, these interagency reviews struggled to define uh, vital national interests that were at issue on the battlefield in Afghanistan. And one element of that was trying to decide whether the Taliban were really a, the defeat of the Taliban was really a vital interest of the United States or not. It was Al Qaeda, of course, that carried out the 9-11 attacks. It was Al Qaeda's continuing uh, cross-border violence from the Pakistani tribal areas that justified, in President Obama's mind, the decision to surge thousands, tens of thousands of combat troops into the country. But there were no uh, Taliban on the plains on 9-11, and uh, with one or two kind of marginal exceptions, the Taliban have never really carried out a um, uh, direct terrorist attack against the United States on American soil. So an example was in uh, 2009, uh, the Obama administration conducted two um, interagency reviews about the war uh, to try to frame the decision to send these combat troops in in such large numbers. And these are, as in all of these reviews, these are smart, um, dedicated, reasonably well-informed individuals, and they, they really press themselves to, to narrowly define the vital national interest that would justify the huge troop surge they're about to undertake. And at the end of a lot of conversation, they identified two. One was Al Qaeda, which was still active along the Pakistan-Afghanistan border, but in the federally administered tribal areas of Pakistan, still carrying out conspiracies to attack uh, American or allied targets across borders. And the other was the security of Pakistan's nuclear weapons. Uh, the nightmare scenario, as uh, I think Steve Hadley put it in the first review of the 2001 war, was that, if, that the war could so destabilize Pakistan that its, uh, that its weapons could fall into the hands of non-state actors and create a, a terrible international crisis. But for a flavor of, of the contradictions in these discussions and definitions of war aims, consider that in 2009, when these two vital interests were identified, Neither of the problems was located in Afghanistan, where we were about to send tens of thousands of troops. Both were across the border in Pakistan. So Al-Qaeda was there, yes, near the border, but on Pakistani soil. And of course, Pakistan's nuclear weapons were in Pakistan. Okay, the President and others notice this contradiction. They come back to the table. All right, well, if the, if the vital interests that we're fighting for are in Pakistan, why are we surging into Afghanistan? And there was a kind of indirect answer that flowed out of that conversation. Well, if we don't stabilize Afghanistan with these troops, the country will collapse back into a 1990s-style civil war. Al Qaeda will return, and that war will also further destabilize Pakistan. Okay, you can follow that reasoning, but it's a rather indirect reason to uh, send American women and men to war. And then there was this issue of the Taliban. In one of these reviews, uh, 
knowing that President Obama was increasingly skeptical about fighting a long-term war against the Taliban, and, and even more skeptical that it could be won militarily, uh, some of his side of the table, representing the White House or the, or the White House views, started to say, well, have we ever really said that we're going to defeat the Taliban, that this, that this is a national interest of the United States? And uh, the next day, the, the Pentagon representatives came back with a PowerPoint deck that had all of the statements of American national leaders since 2001 promising to vanquish the Taliban from the face of the earth. And said, well, you may not have signed up for this war, but you, you know, your, your national leaders have, have made these commitments. <coughs> but of course, even the military uh, and its generals agreed that the war was not going to be won on the battlefield against the Taliban. And so, when the surge was announced, the war aims attached to it involved degrading the Taliban, knocking them back, you know, kind of grade your own homework standards of, of progress in the war that was not decisive and didn't constitute a, a, t a traditional military victory. I mean, in fairness, you could say that the idea was really just to buy time to put Afghan security forces into position to carry the lead in combat and that this was achieved largely but not so well achieved that all American forces uh, could, could leave the battlefield as we see today. So another theme that kind of courses through this um, book is the, the problem of um, politics. Lots of different kinds of problems of politics, but I will I'll, I'll mention a couple. Um, it was uh, common to say and to think, and there was good reason, uh, based on the U.S. experience aiding the Mujahideen against the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan in the 1980s, that it would be difficult to make decisive pro progress in the war if the sanctuary in Pakistan enjoyed by the Taliban and the support, direct and indirect, that it, it enjoyed from Pakistan's main intelligence service, the Inter Inter Services Intelligence uh, Directorate, if that was not prevented or stopped or substantially reduced. The title of the book, Directorate S, refers to the covert action arm of ISI. It's what the Americans sometimes called that arm. And it was uh, an element of ISI that the Americans knew well um, because they had collaborated with it against the Soviets during the 1980s along with the Saudis. It took uh, the Bush administration um, longer than it might have to recognize that ISI was back running the same playbook against NATO and Afghanistan that the U.S. had helped it run against the Soviets in the 80s. They did eventually realize this. But they were stymied um, by their inability to persuade Pakistan's army, which really runs ISI, to change its uh, policy or change its perception of its interests in the Afghan war, which involved uh, uh, prolonging this sanctuary and, and, this, and this aid. And this was one of the reasons why the relationship between the United States and Hamid Karzai fell apart so visibly uh, after 2009. I was a, a kind of a beat reporter on the war. I had covered it for the Washington Post uh, in one phase. I had gone back uh, a lot of times for the New Yorker to write about the war in different ways. And I, I had known, uh, like many Afghan watchers, um, Hamid Karzai reasonably well as a subject over the years. I'd seen him in different settings. I'd interviewed him. I'd watched him uh, in public, lots of different occasions. I thought I understood um, kind of who he was and where he was coming from. But I was surprised when I went back in this history and kind of excavated the details of his relationship with the United States, particularly as it fell apart, to see how consistent he was about one thing, which was if you go back and you look at what was said when he met in private with Americans of all levels, but particularly at the highest levels of the military or of the State Department, he um, would often uh, direct the attention of the Americans he was talking to to the problem of ISI and to Pakistan. And he was, his theme was very consistent. If you don't do something about Pakistan's involvement in the war, um, you're never going to achieve your goals. Now, of course, the Americans would receive this as an evasion of, of Karzai's responsibility for failures of Afghan governance and failures to uh, uh, tackle corruption, including within his own networks and his own family. Um, and it, it was an evasion in that respect. However, um, it was a conviction that Karzai had, and he, was, he wasn't the only one who had it. And we confused him uh, by 
constantly telling him that we respected his views as the sovereign leader of Afghanistan, but then failing to act in the way that he urged to do something to put greater pressure on Pakistan. And this led him to become convinced that we, there must be an ulterior explanation. Not unusual in that part of the world to put one and one together and get three, but Karzai's um, belief, his syllogism sounded like this. The United States is the world's hyperpower. It has, the, it has the ability to coerce action militarily from any enemy in the world. If it wanted to change Pakistan's conduct in Afghanistan, if it wanted to stop ISI's interference in the war, it could. But it's not doing that. So it must want ISI to destabilize Afghanistan in order to justify having a long-term military presence in the country. Now, this conviction settled in after 2012 or 2013, and the more he repeated it to his American counterparts, the more frustrated they became with him. At one point, um, an envoy, a special envoy to Afghanistan named James Dobbins goes out to visit with Karzai, and Karzai rolls out this, this hypothesis again, and Dobbins says to him, you know, Mr. President, um, by now you have all of the WikiLeaks documents. You have all of the Snowden materials. I mean, literally millions and millions of pages of interior American classified discussions about international policy. Can you see any trace of this design that you attribute to us in these documents? And Karzai looks at him and sort of half smiles and says, well, maybe you don't know the plan. There is a deep state in America, as I understand it. <laughs> um, so, Another contradiction, and I'll kind of end it here so we can get to the discussion. Um, I want to pull out because uh, Barney's in the room at least, and I would probably talk about it even if he weren't. But one of the contradictions in U.S. policy after 2009 or before was that um, command after, com after command, the, the American military generals leading the NATO effort in the war, would come to Afghanistan and say publicly, this is not a war that is going to be won on the battlefield. We cannot defeat the Taliban militarily in a conventional sense. Um, I think it was a uh, General Petraeus, the champion of the counterinsurgency doctrine that was carted over to Afghanistan from Iraq um, in 2009, 2010, who said, while he was in command, you know, you can't capture and kill your way out of an industrial strength insurgency. The <coughs> logic was, if you can't win the war militarily, then you'll have to win it through politics, through negotiations, through diplomacy, <coughs> through some kind of political settlement. And yet, year after year, it was the conviction of these same generals that the time wasn't ripe, and year after year, military efforts were resourced um, over diplomatic and negotiating efforts. The book does describe a very fascinating uh, secret negotiation between the Obama administration and the head of the Taliban's political commission at the time, Tayyabaga, that failed in 2013. Um, it's, a very, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. Um, but one of the ways that I come to reflect on that, that whole episode was that it was um, a very compartmented um, negotiation that reflected the unwillingness of the Obama administration to take serious risks around negotiation, diplomacy, and, um, and a political settlement. This was an administration, after all, that pulled off a couple of high-risk political negotiations during a second term, uh, the Iran nuclear agreement, the opening to Cuba. Cuba was supposed to be the third rail of American politics. Somehow this administration figured out how to get all the way forward in that negotiation, whether you agree with the outcomes or not, it's demonstrating that the administration was willing to take political risks around difficult projects of international diplomacy. But in the case of Afghanistan, it didn't. And it's, as a sort of student of Afghan, uh, of Afghan experience in these years, it's frustrating to think um, that these political tracks, even while acknowledged as central, were under-resourced and, under, and, uh, and unsuccessful. We can talk when we get to it about what's going on now because uh, you actually have the irony that the Trump administration has gone further out in front in efforts to explore the possibilities of political negotiation uh, than the, 
than the Obama administration did. But so thank you. I hope that's a helpful way to get us started. I look forward to the discussion. Uh, before we open up for uh, questions and discussion, we'll have some comments by uh, two of our uh, SIPA faculty members, Dipali Mukhopadhyay, uh, whose research in Afghanistan goes back more than 10 years, uh, who wrote uh, recently an excellent book on warlords and state building in Afghanistan, and uh, Stephen Biddle, who has spent a lot of time off and on in the country, uh, including as an advisor and strategy review of the American commander in the country. Um, and we'll get your perspectives before we open up. Holly? Thank you so much, Dick. Um, I'm so happy that we're having this event, and it's a real privilege um, to be able to talk about Steve Cole's extraordinary book. So as I revisited um, the work this week, I, I read it, I'll admit, with a lot of sympathy for President Karzai. And so my focus is going to be on the second uh, problem or theme that came out of the, the challenge of politics. So. I guess to borrow uh, a phrase from Jim Scott, I was seeing this project like the Afghan state, seeing, reading this intervention from that perspective. And I found myself thinking about the inevitable kind of schizophrenia that must come with being situated in between in every way. So it's always been impossible to study uh, Afghan state formation without explicitly contextualizing it within the international system. And Afghanistan, uh, as a result of work by scholars like Barney Rubin, is commonly referred to as a buffer state because it quite literally has been caught in between great powers, but also in the midst of ideological and geopolitical contestation within the neighborhood. And so it's, it's impossible really to understand, I think, the dilemmas of governance in Afghanistan without taking seriously this idea that Steve Krasner came up with of sovereignty as organized hypocrisy. So Krasner basically said, quote, stronger states can pick and choose among different rules selecting the ones that best suit their instrumental objectives. And when we think about victims of that double standard, Afghanistan should be at the top of the list. So. Um, I thought I would share a line from a letter that the historian Hassan Kakar cites. Which this was a letter written by the late 19th century Afghan ruler Abdurrahman Khan. And it reveals this kind of dance involved in navigating between a prospective foreign patron, in his case the British, and the population he claimed to represent. So he wrote to the British, when the British government tells me what are to be the boundaries of Afghanistan, Will a European envoy and a British government remain within those boundaries? What enemy of the British shall I be expected to repel? And what benefits will the government undertake to confer on me and on my countrymen? So you can see in this missive the kind of concerns he had about tying his own hands in this relationship. And of course, when economic rent also comes with a foreign presence, then the, li the liabilities of the relationship grow even more significant. And I think that's a very important analog to the position in which Hamid Karzai found himself from December 2001 onward. But to be in between isn't only a story about exploitation and vulnerability. In the hands of a skillful statesman, it can be an asset. Uh, whereby the survival of the state actually becomes a value proposition that you're offering to those more powerful. And so I'm going to just quickly make the perhaps unpopular case that this is what Hamid Karzai actually achieved. So my, my first book, as Dick mentioned, was an effort to explore the kinds of symbiotic relationships that Karzai, Karzai forged with a number of, of strongmen in an effort to have greater influence over provincial politics. And what interested me about this set of constructive, I argued, albeit imperfect accommodations, was that they laid some kind of groundwork for the expansion um, of the state. And I think part of how we can understand that approach to politics is by 
thinking about the limits that Steve just spoke about imposed on the Afghan state's sovereignty once the planes struck on September 11th. So that the attack opened the possibility for the Karzai government, but also then set the constraints in which it would emerge. So the Karzai government, and this remains true for the Ghani government today, could not control in any kind of a monopoly the use of force within its territory, and yet it would be held responsible for violence that erupted therein, and for any attacks that originated on its soil and occurred elsewhere. And as the years went on, the Afghan government's capacity to engage in diplomacy and war making abroad was entirely defined and constrained also by this relationship with the US and by its position as the key client and geographical site for the so-called global war on terror. So the question becomes, how does one build, leave alone, lead a secure, capable government under those kind of circumstances? And I would argue that as a sovereign ruler in that context, sovereign so-called, you engage in a kind of collaborative schizophrenia in which you act, to borrow a phrase from Lisa Widin, as if you are a sovereign and your international partners act as if as well. In those domains in which Karzai and his team maintained a greater degree of autonomy like political appointments, um, I've described in, in my work a kind of competition management in which Karzai played different strongmen off each other, pulled in technocrats, were useful, and tried to maintain control and influence where possible. And because strongmen were partners, key partners in the Western military campaign, Karzai had more leeway to engage with them in a certain sense. On the other hand, the Taliban, swiftly defeated, uh, was written out of Afghan politics by the Bush administration and defined, as is painstakingly documented in the book, in the early years as paradoxically both non-threatening and irreconcilable. And so a vanquished regime, much like the Ba'athists in Iraq, did not get a spot at the table and instead became the basis uh, for an insurgency. So we can't know where Karzai's accommodationist impulses might have led, but we know that his hands were tied on that front. They were also tied when it came to neighborly relations with Pakistan. So the seeds of an insurgency found safe haven next door, and they took root, and the Karzai regime watched its custodian, the US, persist in supporting this security establishment that seemed committed to building up a, a force that could perpetually undermine its capacity to control politics. So this is what state building looks like in the face of kind of pseudo sovereignty. It's a political performance of, as if one is in charge, when in fact the entire governing project remains subordinate to the interests of this larger military campaign. So the US government liberates Afghanistan, emboldens this new democratic government, but simultaneously restricts, contradicts, undermines that same government in ways I think that help us understand Karzai's fall from hero to mentally unstable uh, in the eyes of the West. But I think, and I'll, and I'll close here, that Karzai actually tapped into a legacy of Afghan statehood that had survived, uh, buried beneath the rubble of decades of war, was this sense among ordinary Afghans and elites alike that there was something that was a nation state that existed despite the vagaries of conflict and the fragilities of government. And I think it's that legacy, that collective memory, which helps us understand how despite all of the turbulence of the last 17 years, despite terror attacks, a poppy economy, standoffs over elections, and this relentless insurgency, we still see fierce competitors finding space for themselves in each other in, in this big tent. And we also see ordinary people participating in politics at great risk, most recently in the parliamentary elections um, this last month. But so that abiding commitment, um, I think should give us a sense of long-term optimism, but it's not very comforting in the current context. And so I just wanna close with a few questions that I, I was left with um, at the end of the book as I sort of thought through the catalog of choices and non-choices that the US and its partners had made. 
Could the United States, I wondered, have defined the terms of its engagement any differently, or were we destined to end up with this sort of connected set of wicked problems and catch-22s? Is it possible to build a sovereign state while waging war in its territory? Can you combat an insurgency when that state has yet to be built? How do you define the terms of the fight as a domestic counterinsurgency when the insurgency's center of gravity exists over the border? How can a government make peace with its enemies when it cannot define the terms of the conversation, leave alone the agreement? And if corruption um, and abuse of power feed insurgent politics, where is the responsibility of interveners uh, for our rampant military and economic abuse? Um, and our ab inability to establish a coherent set of policies. Um, I think it's, it's whatever continuity of stateness and nationhood may run underneath uh, the chaos that we see, that doesn't help us um, feel okay about this profound sort of set of disappointments that have been laid out in the book. And Steve Cole concludes by, by describing this engagement as, quote, a humbling case study in the limits of American power. And so I hope it prompts some, some real, I'm not super optimistic about this, but I hope it prompts some real institutional and political introspection on our part about what can we really realistically expect when we use force to make profound political change our own on our own behalf, but ostensibly on behalf of others as well. I'll just start by reinforcing the, the point that this book is a very good read. Uh, I, I strongly recommend it. Uh, some of you may have come to the belief that it's impossible to say anything important about policy issues without talking about uh, R-squared, endogeneity problems, heteroscedastic disturbances. Uh, it, it is possible to shed some light on these problems that way and in other ways, and this book does, I think, a fine job uh, of shedding a lot of light on an important and complicated problem that has implications for lots of other important and complicated problems in much of the world that the United States continues to face even as the conflict in Afghanistan winds down. This, this conflict, I, I think the book suggests, and, and I've also long felt, is a classic example of the dilemmas posed by real but limited U.S. national security interests in conflicts of these kinds. Uh, People are often asking, as, as Steve pointed out, why are we here? Uh, oddly, I think why we're here in the sense of the, the interests at stake were actually surprisingly clearly articulated by the Obama administration as a result of their 2009 review, and they're the exact two that, that Steve cited, that Afghanistan not become a base by which Al-Qaeda could attack us, and then Afghanistan not become a base for destabilizing its neighbors, which basically Pakistan. The, the problem wasn't that they couldn't identify what interests we were there to pursue. The problem was that over the means that could secure them. And the problem with that was that the ends that those two interests imply are real. If the Obama administration just washed its hands and walked away from this problem and allowed the Karzai government to fall and Afghanistan to return to something like you know, end-sided, atomized, 1990s-style civil warfare, the result could have been a very real threat to the stability of Pakistan and possible al-Qaeda reintroduction into the country. That's, those potential consequences are very hard for elected officials to just walk away from and allow the social, experiment, social science experiment to run, see what happens, and then knowing that they'll be held accountable for a bad result if you get it. But because, as Steve points out, they're indirect, they run through the neighbor, and the, 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 the potential of good policy in Afghanistan as opposed to bad policy in Afghanistan to affect the neighbor is limited and indirect. The administration felt unwilling to make the kind of investment that would be required to secure that stake according to orthodox U.S. doctrine at the time for the way you approach these kinds of problems. The administration, because they thought the stake was real, wanted to do something because they thought the stake was limited, they were not willing to send 160,000, 200,000, 300,000 American soldiers to Afghanistan to try and realize that stake. And that created a dilemma for them that they never really got out of. 
the, you, you could argue that the entire history of the Obama administration's you know, unfortunate arm wrestling with itself over this war is, is a long, unhappy struggle to find some real but limited means to secure ends that they thought were real but limited and in that way kind of bring costs and benefits somehow sort of into alignment. And, and the trouble is the available military doctrine for conducting these kinds of wars is very poorly suited to that kind of search in at least two of a variety of, of possible ways. Uh, one is U.S. thinking about counterinsurgency circa you know, 2009 when the Obama administration began its, its sort of long wrestling with this problem. Uh, tended to see the only way of keeping U.S. involvement as limited is to rely very heavily on an indigenous ally whose military we would improve, equip, train, advise, support, because the doctrine puts a heavy emphasis on providing mass population security to isolate the insurgency from the population, which is a massively labor-intensive enterprise. If that's the way you conceive of these kinds of wars and you want to hold U.S. involvement down, somebody else has got to do it. And the only plausible somebody else is the indigenous Afghan National Army and police force. But there are deep, deep problems in the likely military capacity of military institutions in radically weakly institutionalized political systems like Afghanistan's and like Syria's and like Yemen's and Somalia's and Libya's and Niger. I mean, the, the reason why I see this problem is remarkably broad in nature is this underlying issue of the ability of an indigenous ally who is in, you know, meshed in a weakly institutionalized political setting to provide real military potential themselves, even with American help, is intrinsically very limited by the fact of weak political institutions that cause the military to be used primarily as a tool for internal political balancing by elites in these kinds of settings in ways that systematically reduce that military's ability to profit from American assistance or defeat an insurgency that local elites typically see as a smaller threat to themselves than the threat posed by other armed elites within the ruling group at large, other warlords, uh, other political parties that have access to armed force. So the, the available body of thought at the time for the Obama administration to rely on for dealing with real but limited interests implied the only way to keep our means limited is to rely on an indigenous military that has a very low ceiling on what its military potential is because of the politics of the state in which that military is fighting. The only other way out of this box is the way out that we find ourselves increasingly in now and that Barney Rubin and others have been supporting for a long time. Negotiate a compromise settlement in which we don't get blue sky outcomes, but neither do we get nothing, and in which the fact that our interests are limited, if real, means in principle we could live with a compromise negotiated settlement that gives us a limited realization of our goals. But here too, available American military thought circa 2009 was of no help in this way. The, the available kind of playbook of you know, military operational routines that the command could bring to bear at the time that McChrystal you know, took office was all about you know, isolating the insurgents from the population and how to go about doing that. That's not a particularly helpful military approach if what you're really trying to do is set up a negotiated settlement to the war, in which what you would like is for the military power in the country to be the hammer, to go along with a carrot that you're going to combine somehow in some sort of negotiating strategy and in which this massive American engagement in the war is coordinated in some way that goes beyond a handful of individuals who are carrying out you know, you know, negotiations and thinking about negotiations on the side, for, for all of the resources we're spending in the country to be brought to bear to assist in a negotiating strategy, everybody has to understand that that's the purpose. And that the resources we have available need to be put to that end and are probably going to be used more flexibly than you know, population-centric counterinsurgency implies, which involves taking American military forces and drilling them into the ground uh, 
in specific Afghan population centers to guarantee to the local Afghans that we won't go away and they won't be abandoned, that makes the, the military in the theater an extraordinarily inflexible tool for supporting a negotiating strategy where you would want a substantial amount of flexibility in how you use military assets. The, the result of this was a body of thought and a body of doctrine and a body of understanding about how you wage war in these kinds of conflicts that was very poorly suited to limited U.S. national interests in which we weren't going to be willing to commit enough troops to actually secure the population ourselves until we could bring about an end to the war through negotiation or some other means that, that we could live with. Um, and that, I think, tends to tee up what's like, what, what was in Afghanistan and is likely to continue to be in other settings, very, very frustrating and uh, unpleasant domestic political debates in the United States where political leaders want some real but limited military tool to do some kind of compromise, real but limited realization of ends that they don't think warrant sending massive investments of U.S. resources into these countries. And the military doctrine at hand is poorly suited to it. Um, so I, I think if we're going to get better outcomes in the future, which we may or may not, uh, a more flexible way of thinking about how we use the military in support of negotiations would be a useful tool to doing that. Now, because as a, uh, a political scientist, I, I tend to be very interested in counterfactuals, <laughs> uh, which you know, most historians in my experience and some journalists in my experience uh, tend to be less fascinated with. <laughs> uh, I'm nevertheless going to, to <laughs> pose a couple of them to Steve since the, the Poor fit between the military means and real but limited ends suggests frustration. How much less frustrating could this war have been if plausibly different policies were adopted? It, I mean, the, the situation we're in now is, is one in which if things go right, and I'm guardedly hopeful that they might, we could end up with a negotiated settlement that arguably we could have had eight years ago six years ago, five years ago, at, at much lower cost in dollars and lives. Um, is, is that the best one could reasonably hope for? And was, was that realistically achievable? If, if you could change a couple of things about the U.S. approach to and conduct of this conflict, which ones would you change and how much upside potential for a better or at least less costly outcome uh, of this adventure do you think was possible? <laughs> You're right, I don't like counterfactuals, but, uh, um, I, you know, inevitably, working so long and, uh, on something like this, you, you think about those questions. And I, I suppose I would start, and Dipali uh, alluded to this, in the period um, after Bonn, say, from, you know, 2002 to 2004, if there was ever a time when um, there was an opportunity to set a different trajectory at relatively low cost through just better eyesight and policy. That was it. I, I kind of laughed at, at Dipali's phrase that the Taliban were judged by the Bush administration after the collapse of the Islamic Emirate as both non-threatening and irreconcilable, which is a very nice phrase. I wish I'd had it for the book, but uh, <laughs> they, um, you know, there was an opportunity to um, avoid the error of the dissolution of the Ba'ath Party and the dissolution of the Iraqi army. And in this case, the opportunity was to recognize uh, what history makes plain, which is that in victory, if you seek a stable political outcome in the aftermath of your military success, um, yes, you can decide that enemy leaders are accountable, should be held accountable, that there should be some kind of justice administered to the enemy force if, you, if, if that is a, an indigenous uh, process largely and not necessarily imposed by outside invaders. But you can't hold every foot soldier, every sergeant, every lieutenant responsible for the conduct of the Islamic Emirate. And that's what we did. We, we branded every Taliban a terrorist and we sent many of them without knowing who they were or what they'd done in the war off to Guantanamo and we created conditions that made um, the fitful efforts at political reconciliation that were pursued during the kind of Khalilzad era, uh, where a few kind of ex-Islamic Emirate ministers, you know, came in from the cold and uh, made it just diff very difficult to take the achievement of Bonn and incorporate into it a sustainable 
uh, Afghan pluralism through that, through that misguided policy. And now, you know, there were so many obstacles that even if you had been wise and even if you had undertaken that kind of an effort and prioritized it, um, you know, given Pakistan's view of the Bon arrangements and the military's influence over Pakistan's regional policy and other factors, it still might have been, uh, it still might have been very difficult. But that seems to me the time where the greatest opportunity was missed. Later, you know, in thinking about the 2009 period and the surge, I mean, clearly with, you know, for the reasons that you very well described, um, the military doctrine that led 140,000, 150,000 international combat troops to be trying to um, separate insurgents from the population and create conditions for a political settlement, at least in theory, in 2011, that was the wrong doctrine. What was the alternative that wouldn't have resulted in the Taliban marching into cities? There was probably one. You would probably be able to design it with 30 or 40,000 troops and, and, a, and a different kind of um, doctrine, but it would have had to have been connected to a whole of government um, plan to find a political settlement that would lead to a, to a stabilizing drawdown and exit. And one of the things that was so depressing about doing this reporting, especially about the second, uh, the, the first term of the Obama administration, was to realize, I mean, in, in this case, it wasn't just that the government didn't organize its military leverage to support a negotiation. It was that very different and independent-minded and powerful sectors of the government, of the Obama administration, did not believe in a negotiation, did actually saw the Taliban as irreconcilable and something that really justified their, their commitments militarily. And so the Pentagon, and this, this happened in the 80s, too, with Afghan policy. You know, there's something about the magic of the interagency process where the departments just don't agree on basic assumptions about uh, the, the strategy or the outcome. And, and the wordsmiths create these, these uh, national security decision directives that have guidance that is distributed out to the system, the effect of which is that everybody gets to fight their own war. <laughs> and, and you realize that, you know, from a citizen's perspective or a taxpayer's perspective, you need presidents who understand how resistant our big, uh, well-resourced, independent-minded system is to unified effort around goals that everyone may not agree with, and that you absolutely have to be committed to forcing the system into the unified effort that you were describing. Because if you don't take extraordinary efforts to insist on it, it the, the natural gravity of, uh, of the, those of those interests and those views, all sincerely held, uh, will, will defeat you. And I think it did, that, that was a factor in the Obama administration. I don't think that, um, you know, there was, well, I mean, it's subtler than that. The president prioritized al-Qaeda. The CIA was, was leading the war against al-Qaeda through, through the drone campaign in Fatah, and he wanted them to pursue that policy. But the connection between prioritizing that line of action and the declared goal of trying to get to a sustainable drawdown in Afghanistan, that, that was never, those two things were never kind of forced into, into alignment. Paula, you have any comment on this? Yeah, I, I, well, I actually just wanted to ask one more question of Steve, which was, do you think <coughs> there was some critical juncture early on, or maybe later, in which the relationship with the ISI could have taken a different path, or do you think that's just an unsolvable dilemma? It's interesting. It's kind of a mystery of the history. I don't feel like I cracked it. But what you can see is that, okay, so uh, the Musharraf government advised against um, the U.S.-led um, war in the fall of 2001, but when it went ahead anyway, despite their warnings, uh, they cooperated. Um, up to a point, um, providing basing, overflight rights, and lots of other support. And on the counterterrorism side, they um, negotiated a kind of unwritten agreement that they would cooperate against uh, U.S. priorities, uh, non-Pakistani nationals associated with al-Qaeda, Uzbeks, Arabs, Chechens, and Taliban leadership and that they would cooperate with a detention regime and an extradition regime that they didn't necessarily agree with, but they, that was the price they were, were gonna pay for maintaining their legitimacy in the international system. 
So here's the mystery. So there's a little bit of stability in the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. It may not be on terms that you would, you would endorse if you had the ability to rewrite them, but there was a kind of an equilibrium in the relationship that gradually um, unwound. And at some point, circa 2004 to 2005, it seems clear that the, the core command of the Pakistan army made an affirmative decision to um, facilitate the revival of a Taliban insurgency as an instrument of Pakistan interests in the region, uh, but only to such a degree as uh, could be uh, carried out with full deniability so that Pakistan wouldn't get caught and pay a price in the international system. At some point, there is a, there is a series of decisions that Musharraf participates in, but he, he carries them out, and I think, you know, the, the collectors eventually got clear evidence about roughly when this happened. But the, the mystery is why. Why did the Pakistani Army Command think that reviving the Taliban's insurgency and destabilizing Afghanistan was, um, was in their national interest at that time? And what you hear people say is a couple or three things. One was uh, related to our strategic nuclear deal with India. Um, we, we cut that deal with India around this time, uh, and we also made it clear to the Pakistan High Command, Mushar, personally, you're not going to get this agreement because of uh, AQ Khan and your proliferation record, you're not reliable. And uh, the Pakistani High Command essentially said to itself, you've made yourself clear. You're going to, you see India as your strategic partner for the 21st century in this region. We're, you're a rent-a-cop and uh, you're not going to uh, take risks or, or invest in our economic growth, our energy security, our strategic uh, vision, and so let's go back and think about where our interests lie in the region. And then the second factor, which happened around the same time, was, of course, our invasion of Iraq and the consequences of the draw on U.S. forces and resources that Iraq soon uh, made. And what did we do as we saw that Iraq was going south and that, um, uh, we were, we were, that this was going to be the Bush administration's first, second, and third priority in comparison to Afghanistan? We turned security in Afghanistan over to our NATO allies, um, almost in exchange for their being absolved of having to participate in the Iraq war. So the Canadians rotate down, uh, the Dutch are in charge of uh, another sector, and the British uh, go to Helmand. And the Pakistani High Command, I think, uh, from my reporting, essentially saw this as fulfillment of their prophecy that the Americans are never going to stay here again. They, this is what they do. They come and they go, and that they didn't see uh, this kind of NATO peacekeeping operation, this, this extension of fairly light uh, st stability operations out of Kabul as anything other than an American abandonment. So you have those two, two kinds of resentments or, or perceptions building up. And so then why wouldn't we go back to our playbook? These guys are, are on the move anyway. We have to decide, are we in or are we out? What are, why would we help the Americans at that point? So um, I think that's, that's roughly, I think that's roughly right. Well, on uh, ISI support of the Taliban, I'm wondering uh, what accounts for American toleration of it for so long. From the outside, it, it looks bizarre. Uh, to be <clears throat> funneling lots of money and cooperation to the regime that is d directly supporting supposedly the combatants against you. Was that because of the dependence on Pakistan for logistics? Uh, was it because uh, we never found the smoking gun to, uh, to, to uh, hold their feet to the fire? I mean, I, after all 700, so pages of your book, I didn't remember anything in it that indicated that we ever really did find the smoking gun that we could say, here, this mm -hmm. proves it, and you can't squirm away from the charges mm -hmm. anymore. Or was that irrelevant? Uh, it was a factor. I think your other, a couple other factors, one you may, named, were more important. I think you do have a smoking gun in Mumbai. I mean, they, in Mumbai, the evidence in Mumbai basically exposed the way the Pakistani service works. And the U.S. system did get bogged down, especially in the 2005-2006 period, with a lot of debates about whether there were rogue CIA, I mean, rogue ISI officers, whether there were 
contractors or retirees who are ideological, ideologically motivated and didn't have the support of the high command. And you know, that was, um, that was wasted time because I think what the evidence really shows, and Mumbai gives you a very clear case study of it, is that this is a covert action service, a professional paramilitary covert action service that's organized like a lot of professional covert mil action military service, paramilitary, paramilitary services. It has chain of command, uh, starting with the three-star general who runs the place. It has serving active uniform military officers, running operations down to the level of colonel. As a CIA officer, operations officer who had worked on ISI for many, many years said to me at one point, you know, there's no more likely to be a rogue Pakistani colonel in ISI than there is to be a, a, a rogue American tank commander on a battlefield. It's, I mean, it could happen, but it's mm -hmm. generally not the way things go. This is a the very tight military discipline. But what else do you need to achieve? You need to achieve deniability. So how do you achieve deniability? Then you contract out, you build layers so that the people who are on the front lines and most likely to be arrested or exposed don't lead directly back up the chain of command. And that's what, if you look at the Mumbai case study, that's exactly what they did. We can see exactly how that operation was built and it was mostly built with contractors of the very sort that we have to train our you know, paramilitary services or our special forces, folks who were in the service but are now out, they might be semi-retired, uh, they're, they're deniable in one way or another. So they used a lot of contractors, but at, at various points as the operation was getting closer, the, the people who were actually gonna carry it out had contact with serving active officers who they could identify. And so that's, you know, that's, that seems to me the, the real structure about ISI. So well, why didn't we do something about it? Logistics was a big trap, and it proved to be a trap in 2011 when under General Petraeus' uh, time, I think they tried to, to essentially put up with the blockade that the Pakistanis imposed by flying everything through Russian authorized routes and across the Gulf. And at that point, the number of troops in was very large. It was very, very expensive. I, I mean, as a taxpayer, I don't even want to know how much it costs to avoid <laughs> Pakistani lines of, uh, of supply, but they did it for a while. But it was a big impediment. But I think the other thing to really keep in mind, big picture-wise, and this is why the Trump administration's current pressure on Pakistan, um, which is understandable, has to be seen uh, in, in its own context of 2018 and not in the context of 2009. Remember, between 2007 and 2012 or so, Pakistan went through the greatest period of violent domestic instability that it had known in decades. Uh, thousands, and the Pakistani Taliban arose from the crisis of the Red Mosque, collected themselves on the Western frontier, turned against the Pakistani state, car bombed ISI buildings, assassinated serving Pakistani generals as they worshiped in Rawalpindi, went to war with the Pakistani state. And there was a moment there in 2009 where the Pakistani Taliban marched out of Buner and everyone was panicked that they were gonna walk into Islamabad. I mean, the country was highly, highly unstable. And if you think about the objective of not having an outcome of the American intervention in Afghanistan be the, de the profound destabilization of Pakistan, which might cause it to lose control of its uh, nuclear weapons, then this was not a time to kind of push the Pakistani state to the precipice. The, it was, the Obama administration was kind of self-censoring because it didn't want to exacerbate what it could see was a very serious domestic crisis. And so instead of using sanctions or putting ISI generals on travel ban lists or trying to delegitimize the Pakistani army and the international system or all these kind of hardline ideas that are floating around now, they felt like their first job was to make sure Pakistan did not split, collapse. It was Kayani who kept saying, he says, you know, we have to fight this counterinsurgency so it feels to Pakistanis like it's 98 against two. If it's 55 against 45, we're gonna lose this country. And that means you're gonna to have to hang in there with us and not put too much pressure on us. And so, you know, it looks feckless in, retros in retrospect to go over there to marsh after to marsh. I have a lawyer son who, who has formed a little band with his friends called Strongly Worded Letter, because that's what <laughs> lawyers are always sending to people, strongly worded letter. And that's what we sent to the Pakistanis again and again. We go over there with a strongly worded letter, and they would just ride us, uh, ride us away. And, and so, but anyway, I, 2018 is a different place. The Pakistan army did regain uh, control of domestic security to a great extent, obviously not to a 100%, but it's a very different world in Pakistan now, and so it's actually a time where the Pakistan system, I think, can be pressured without the same consequences as would have um, 
been at risk in 2009. Floor is open for questions. Thank you. Um, my name is Matthew Murray. I'm an adjunct professor at SEPA this fall and former Obama administration official. And I also serve as a commissioner on the Joint Independent and Monitoring Evaluation Committee of Afghanistan, which reports up to the president on the government of Afghanistan's efforts to um, prevent corruption in, in ministry. So they work, I work on the state building side of the ledger. Uh, a question uh, arises in my mind as I listen to you about how much value you attach to the state building side of what we do in, in Afghanistan as an underpinning, as a precondition for a sustainable peace, if we can get to the point of negotiating peace. And in particular, a, a comment, I'd like you to comment on something that President Ghani said before an international audience in Copenhagen in October. It was the International Anti-Corruption Conference um, it's held annually and sponsored by Transparency International. During the plenary session, he gave a video uh, set of remarks in which he started by saying, there is no trade-off between fighting corruption and gaining peace. And he was reflecting on lessons learned, I think, uh, from many state-building efforts over the last you know, two decades, that when we try to make those trade-offs, we end up empowering people networks and giving them resources and allowing them to undermine the stability of the state and increase the gri grievances that are causing the, the you know the insecurity so. yeah it'd be good to ask to Pauli to, to jump in I, I don't really have a kind of international um, development or international relations or political science kind of high conviction about the question you ask it's really not my Field, but what I can say in in about the history that that uh, I tried to organize in this book is that arguments about those questions were repetitive and 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 often counterproductive. They included arguments about whether or not counter counter, counter narcotics uh, strategy was um, advancing or under or undermining efforts to politically stabilize Afghanistan. Uh, those were repetitive arguments. They they barely uh, in the interagency could agree on the facts about how much um, uh, revenue the Taliban derived from uh, narcotics taxation, for example. About corruption, there's one of my favorite situation room scenes in the book is uh, documents of meeting that was held in 2010 where the State Department, perhaps even Professor Rubin, had written some kind of white paper about ways to think about the problem of corruption in the Karzai government. And it tried to identify different kinds of corruption and their different implications for um, you know American goals and policy. So you have ordinary graft the at the level of you have to pay someone to get your electricity turned on, then you have kind of systemic uh, corruption where people are bidding for offices and judgeships and things and, and then almost guaranteeing the maladministration of justice and, and, of the, and of the state. And then you have high level corruption, you know, the sort of at the top of the cabinet and the and networks around the Karzai's political machine. And then there was this big debate about how, well, they don't have equal weight in our thinking and it just, I mean, it was, it, it, you could see how very smart people had gotten themselves into a into a very bad box in talking about these things. And there was a there's an exchange where, where I think it's Gates who who basically agrees that it's the it's the it's the huge, and unmanaged scale of our aid investments that is creating this these conditions for for corruption. He sort of accepts that, and and then people start yelling at each other. Well, no, it's not our fault. And uh, so anyway, um, but. You, you probably have a, a more of a kind of considered hypothesis about state building and, and you know, stability, the use of strong, strong men as a compromise, or how to think about that kind of politics. Yeah, well, I would just say, I mean, I think historically, but also in a number of cases beyond the Afghan one today, there's, it's a much more 
complicated relationship. I think using the word corruption, no, no one including, uh, I'm loath to defend corruption, but I think if you think about um, a politics of accommodation and, and an enormous inflow of resources with tremendous uncertainty and instability and the absence of a clear set of formal rules that sort of govern economic activity but also political activity, that these kind of relationships and dynamics emerge. And, and you know, President Ghani, I think, recognized that as he approached even his own campaign to become president in 2014 when he part took, took as his first vice president one of the most notorious uh, strong men in the country. And, and that pattern has played itself out on a number of occasions. And, uh, you know, I think the, the other thing to, to say about this is that I, I do think Steve's last point about the role of, of the U.S. sort of presence in terms of the volume of money that has entered the system, but also the fact that, and, and Barney has made this argument elsewhere, that you know, if the, if the project of state building is done in the service of a counterterrorism mission, then, and, and my remarks kind of tried to get at this, one is constantly talking about transparency, anti-corruption, institution building on the one hand, and on the other hand, very explicitly engaging with, supporting, financing, maintaining relationships with the very sets of actors and organizations that are undermining that other project. So I think th there's a, as I said, there is a sort of implicit hypocrisy in the project then, and and my issue I think has generally been been with sort of black and white characterizations of particular actors or ecosystems as corrupt or problematic. It's a much larger kind of structural challenge, and the intervention is inherent to the challenge. Stephen, could I ask you one question? When you were talking about the inadequacy of military doctrine as it was available in 2009 and 2010, you could have heard you as implying that we've solved this. I mean, is there a doctrine that has emerged from the lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan that's different? I, I think one is starting to. The, the critical doctrinal literature available in 2009 is being revised and rewritten. The doctrine is updated periodically all the time. Uh, and the nature of the revision that's ongoing, I think, is moving in the right direction, but it has a long way to go yet. The, the underlying problem is a doctrine as it existed in 2009 presupposed interest alignment between the United States and the local host. The, the host wants legitimacy as the doctrine defined uh, as government and in the interests of the governed. The United States surely wants that too. The reason we have an insurgency is because the host doesn't have enough stuff. They don't have enough soldiers, they don't have enough roads, enough wells, enough weapons, enough hospitals. Therefore, what the United States will do is stabilize the situation while, with our own soldiers while we transfer the stuff that will enable an indigenous ally who wants what we want to realize our common ambition for governing legitimacy and defeat of the insurgency. And the problem is that's almost never an accurate characterization of the host. If the host wanted legitimacy defined as this way, there wouldn't be an insurgency and we wouldn't be doing any counterinsurgency. We, we tend not to do counterinsurgency in Switzerland very much. <laughs> um, if there is such a problem that, that we need to be involved in counterinsurgency, we're normally dealing with an, in, with an indigenous ally who is not governing in the interests of the majority of the population for any of a variety of reasons. And therefore, there's a misalignment of political interest which if we allow to continue is going to undermine the effectiveness of our goal of defeating the insurgency, which is rarely the primary goal of the indigenous ally. The indigenous ally is typically much more worried about the internal balancing politics within the regime than they are about an external threat from an insurgency that's usually a much less proximate threat to them than rival armed elites within the ruling group at large are. So, th and that's a big part of why the 2009 Doctrine and military effort was so unsuccessful in my view. We, we, we thought that by transferring stuff, we would improve the ability of the host to f defeat the people we cared about, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, and the transfer of the stuff in an environment where internal balancing was, the, was Karzai's priority, uh, 
mostly ended up with vast amounts of it being redirected into graft and corruption and rewarding of uh, uh, cronies for loyalty and all of the rest. Uh, what the doctrine is, what the trend in the doctrinal thinking right now is, is toward an increasing recognition that if there's an insurgency, probably there's a major interest misalignment mm -hmm. between the United States and the indigenous government, and therefore political leverage to persuade the indigenous government to behave in ways that the indigenous government will not normally think are a good idea is going to be necessary if success is going to happen. Where the doctrine still hasn't gotten there, in my view, is providing guidance specifically on how to, to produce that leverage. In conceptualizing military power in a setting like this, largely as a tool for realigning the political interest calculus of the indigenous ally, rather than as a tool for defeating an insurgency that, that's external to the indigenous ally. I, that, I don't think this is mission impossible intellectually, but it's just, but, you know, turning the great super tanker of American military doctrine is a slow process. I, I think it started, I think the direction it's moving in is helpful. I think there are ways it can be done, and I, I think the doctrine will therefore get better. Uh, and, but an important change that has happened is I think the US military increasingly recognizes that if they allow an indigenous ally whose interests are internal balancing to simply pursue that goal, the insurgency is not going to be damaged very much. And our aid will largely be wasted and massively inefficient. And therefore, the aid needs to be reconceptualized as more political than it's been thought of. Isn't the problem you're talking about, though, way above the level of military doctrine? Isn't it <laughs> an essential sort of policy conception or misconception? Uh, that, that you're talking about that, uh, that applies uh, with much broader implications? Well, but I think when, where I've seen this done reasonably well, and I think Petraeus and Crocker in 2007 in Baghdad are a case of it being done reasonably well, it, it's because the military actors and the political actors both understand enough of each other's business that they can collaborate meaningfully to use the, the resources that the military overwhelmingly controls as a tool in a politico-military strategy to change the indigenous host behavior at the margin and make more progress against the threat we care about and the indigenous host often does not. And if, if the military is given no specific guidance at all on how can military force be used as leverage, A, the collaboration won't work because they won't be able to communicate meaningfully, uh, and B, we'll start doing things with our military that are actively damaging. I'll, I'll give you one example and then I'll, then I'll stop. Um, 2006 to nine military doctrine said, you need to build up the indigenous allies' military capability and it's essential that you build their logistical system to do that, that the ally will, you know, if, if you, you know, will be unsustainable if you don't build them a logistics system. So we set out to create an Iraqi and an Afghan logistics system as fast as we could. U.S. support of their logistics is probably the single best military leverage opportunity in these kinds of campaigns because it's a military asset that's divisible, revocable, and can be made contingent. You can turn it on and turn it off, direct it to this brigade and, that not, and not that indigenous brigade. If they you know, fire the corrupt crony from brigade command, then you can re restore the logistical support. It, it, it's a rheostat. It's wonderfully flexible. If we follow our own military doctrine, though, and we build the logistics system as fast as we can, what we do is we disempower our political leadership in the theater of one of their most potentially useful tools. If the military doesn't understand that their purpose is to empower a political strategy, and that that political strategy requires leverage to change the interest calculus of the ally, they'll go off and they'll build military programs that make that impossible. Hi, uh, Garbo speaks. Um, uh, Barney Rubin, New York University. Uh, I just want to make two observations and, and ask for your comment on them. Um, one of them is, Steve, about this point you made about the resistance within the government to 
being able to entertain the idea that it might be possible to have a negotiation with the Taliban. I will try not to talk about this too much. Uh, but um, it occurs to me, uh, what I sort of began to think, and I would like your comment on this, after all, the people in the, it's not just a matter of doctrine or the organizations. These people come from our society, American society. A society that elected as president a man who said he wanted to shut down the entry of Muslims into the United States uh, and who hired as his national security advisor, first national security advisor, someone who basically said that all Muslim political activists are terrorists. And simply I found that, the, that our country is not, was, uh, as reflected in its state, was unequipped to conceive of the idea that people who were so different and, and hostile to our values in certain ways were not necessarily our enemies in the sense of people who are trying to do us harm. And it became it just almost impossible to have that discussion. Uh, and we attributed hostility to them. There, and there was a very strong emotional even resistance, this is what I felt, to entertaining arguments that you could negotiate with such people, which I found, by the way, on both the left and the right. I won't go into any anecdotes. Second. The most um, convincing, the best analysis of Afghan politics that I ever saw while I was in the government was a PowerPoint presentation from the Treasury Department about money laundering and corruption. And I looked at it and I said, my God, this is real Afghan politics. Whereas, as Steve, uh, just to rephrase what Steve said, the predominant idea was that state building equals money plus training. Politics plays no part in it, except it must be legitimated by elections. And the only kind of politics that we conceived of was our politics, elections, and whether we could classify people as being our allies or foes. I'm over-exaggerating, it doesn't apply equally to everyone, of course, I want to say. But um, as an institution, we, see, we did not seem to have a way of grappling with what I as a political scientist, or what Dipali as a political scientist, would see as Afghan politics which did not fit any of those grids. Well, I think on the first thing, it's, it is um, striking for me as kind of a uh, reporter who tours the bureauc bureaucracy in different ways, different phases of time, um, how much emotion did build up in the system by 2009, 2010, still there about Pakistan more than the Taliban. I mean, you have to reconcile your, your kind of uh, uh, critique of the, the Trump administration's anti-Muslim anti policies with also their willingness to talk to the Taliban now. Why? Because they want out of the war. Um, so, but, the, but the role of emotion in um, uh, the capacity of decision makers who were otherwise, you know, obviously, as always, very put upon. We were in the middle of the banking crisis, the Great Recession, the President um, had inherited this war. It wasn't um, one that he had a great deal of optimism about. So all these, uh, uh, and, the, and the, the Pentagon was still engaged in Iraq as well, as well as many other theaters. So there were all of these, you know, various pressures. And yet in the discussions about the Taliban in Pakistan, um, there was this emotion that was built up from the battlefield and from the experience that a lot of um, commanders who had been in eastern Afghanistan and in southern Afghanistan from 2006 forward brought home when they lost a lot of comrades and they watched you know, the Pakistani border guards let enemy units come through and whack their guys and, and then they would you know, be on those ramp ceremonies and then they came home to policy cell decision making roles and they, you know, they brought that bitterness with them and then they would fly over to Islamabad and the Pakistanis would just say, Quetashura, Quetashura, you, there's no such thing as the Quetashura. And there's no, there, are, there are no Taliban leaders in our country. And you know, the 11th time you've, you've heard that PowerPoint after you've, you know, following a ramp ceremony, you know, it, it stays with you for the rest of your life. I, I've been talking sometimes to the national security bureaucracy since the book came out. And I, I say, I ask analysts usually, and I just say, you know, how much emotion is still in the system about Pakistan? I mean, you're, you're supposed to be able to rise above. Do you think that there, there, there is any way for our system right now to think about Pakistan's interests in this and how to kind of get past 2011 and, and you know, 
try to see the world from their point of view. Is that something that is emotionally possible? And they basically say no. <laughs> no I don't think so. And uh, uh, so, you know, then you can say, well, as a trained analyst, you know that if you feel that something is emotionally uh, you know, unshakable, you, maybe you should step out of the room and come back in and look at it and see if there's some insight you can bring to it. So, um, yeah, that was, that was very powerful, both um, on the ground in the region, uh, in the embassy, in the command units, and then back, I think, in Washington and in the interagency a lot of the time. Do you want to do the other one? No, yeah? I want to okay. hear what you say on the other one. Which was the other one? On the politics. Why don't you talk, think about the politics? The, the politics of... Af the Af Afghan politics. Oh, right? Afghan Within politics. Oh. Making a US policy. Well, I, mean, I remember talking to you uh, maybe uh, before you went into government when there was this kind of movement of anthropology in the war to try, you know, that, that the way the counterinsurgency doctrine or, or its predecessors was going to succeed was that for, for US majors, uh, you know, at the district level, to be able to understand the, the cultural and social and, uh, and ethnic forces around them so that they wouldn't build their wells in the wrong place and that they would develop sustainable political consensus around uh, this you know, transfer of resources and state building. And I think it might have been you or somebody like you said something like, <laughs> any, any doctrine that requires a U.S major on a six-month tour to understand the social, cultural, and ethnic landscape around his encampment is not the right doctrine. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the problem we should be trying to solve. And, you know, I'm afraid that in general around politics, um, it wasn't, wasn't only that we weren't trying, it was also something that, that as, as in your hypotheses, was, you know, sort of beyond our ability to fully understand in the way that all of the layers of actors uh, engaged with it inevitably did, and that their balancings and their, their compromises, their alignments, their negotiations were, were really properly not something that we were going to be able to, to manage um, and, and really shouldn't have seen our interests there as, as linked to that. Um, hi, um, my name is Rishi. I'm a first year SIPA student and I'm currently taking a class on the UN peacekeeping and um, we're learning a lot about you know, peacekeeping missions around the world and also uh, how sustainable peace is a concept that the UN is really looking at. So I was just wondering in, in, in this conflict, how big of a stakeholder is the UN uh, historically and going forward? take one crack at it. Um, I, it's interesting. I mean, some of the people that have taught me the most about Afghan politics o over more than a decade have been the people who've been working in the UN mission inside uh, Afghanistan, not just in Kabul, but in, uh, you know, all over the country. Um, but I, I think the UN is in a, it's in an interesting position. I mean, when, when I think it was Brahimi who came up with that fr this phrase of light footprint, wasn't it? Was it Brahimi, Barney? Right? Yeah. Who said light footprint? Right. So that the un unlike the missions that had you know taken place late in the late 90s, for example, where the UN was involved in a much more substantial way, in this case it was sort of a quieter uh, a quieter role and a, a, a much less of the kind of trusteeship style of for example, in the Balkans. Um, but I think even then it was complicated. I mean, I, I was in Afghanistan during the 09 um, electoral kind of catastrophe that is very interestingly um, detailed in Steve's book. And even in that small UN office, if I recall correctly, there was a major conflict between the special representative of the secretary general and the deputy special representative of the secretary general. The deputy was uh, an old colleague and friend of Ambassador Holbrooks, Peter Galbraith was his name. And if I remember right, he ended up 
the fallout happened actually on the pages of the New York Times in an op-ed that he wrote in which he exposed the, his belief about the kinds of fraud uh, that had happened and, and that it was the role of the UN to expose that and talk about it. And Kai Ida, who was his boss and also close friend, um, had a different idea about what the role of the UN was. I think a quiet, an idea about a quieter role. And so, I mean, this kind of comes back, I think, to Barney's comment about politics, which I'm also remembering that when, when my book came out, Barney said to me, you know, it would be great if you came and talked to our team about what you found. At the same time, I'm not sure we would know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think there is this, I mean, just in that conflict between Galbraith and Ida, I think for the UN, this question arose as to what is the appropriate role of the representative of the Secretary General? Is it to expose and then hold to some kind of possibly unrealistic kind of standard what an election should look like, what the, what the second presidential election should look like? Or is it in fact to behind the scenes um, play a more moderate role and s bring different parties together and facilitate conversation and negotiation? My feeling is it's, it's more the latter, but I'm not sure, I mean, just given that one particular conflict, I'm not sure the UN as a whole for sure has figured out, leave alone a single mission. Hi, thank you. Um, my name's Aman Kamran, I'm a student at SEPA. So my question is for you, Steve. Um, I believe in your book you note that you believe that the ISI did not know that Osama bin Laden was in Pakistan. Do you still believe that? <laughs> well, that's not, it, what I said is I could find no affirmative evidence uh, to prove that they, that they knew he was there. And I'm very much an evidence-driven person. And uh, I, I would be entirely prepared to believe that they, that they did know. Um, the only evidence that suggests they did is uh, anonymous quotations in respected, uh, respected other journalists, one anonymous quotation and in a respected journalist's uh, account of, uh, of the episode. And, and you know, I, I don't know who that source is. I couldn't find such, such a source that gave me, on any background or other ground rules, um, the kind of confidence uh, to, to say that they did. I thought the, the one interesting open source record, um, you know, obviously the circumstantial evidence is, is uh, terrible from my size point of view. And you know how Pakistanis themselves reacted after the discovery, um, which was, you know, the, the media and the opposition and civilian politicians all over the country felt emboldened to say to ISI, to the army, either you knew and you were complicit with this crime or you are utterly incompetent. And for the next six weeks, and in all my experience of interviewing in Pakistan, every time you would meet a uh, uniform military officer or ISI officer and the subject would come up, they would say, we are that incompetent. <laughs> that was their argument. And they would actually give examples, like, you know, there was a time when uh, the Pakistani Taliban raided, you know, GHQ and Rawalpindi and killed, uh, you know, a uh, at least a brigadier, maybe a two-star general, and, and lots of other officers um, inside an army compound at the heart of Rawalpindi. And one person I was talking to pointed out, I said, that cell lived right over the wall in Rawalpindi, planning that attack for six months, and we didn't know they were there, because we don't always know where these guys are. Uh, so anyway, um, take it for, for what you will, but that the, the, the open source evidence that's interesting is the translations of bin Laden's letters. Um, they, you know, they, they provide indications that you would expect of kind of indirect uh, outreach by Al Qaeda types to, um, you know, to Pakistan, Pakistani types about, well, you know, can we find um, uh, some kind of political alignment that will be stabilizing? But when he has his, his son or his uh, family members being smuggled from Iran into um, Pakistan to join him at the house, at the compound, his letters are super paranoid about running into Pakistani security forces. So they clearly didn't have like an easy, you know, what do you call them, less pass uh, kind of uh, get out of jail uh, travel card for any of his family members. And, uh, and, and so anyway, the, 
there's a there's a scene where um, that his his youngest wife testified to, where they're moving from um, Haipur, where they were staying for a while outside Peshawar, to Abbottabad or no to Swat. And there's a, there's a Pakistani policeman who gets in the van with them and rides with them and then gets out and they get to their house. Okay, so who is that? I mean, who, who, who was that someone they hired? Was that someone assigned to them? You know, the evidence is, is you know, it's, it's amb ambiguous, but it, I could find no affirmative testimony, documents, or other, uh, even background interviewing, and I look, I promise. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I hope someday I will, I will, uh, break the story uh, when, when information surfaces. Sometimes it takes, it takes time. Yes? Um, as I recall, also in Bin Laden's computer report, the Al-Qaeda leadership held a meeting to try to decide whether Pakistan was their friend or their enemy, and they could not reach a decision. Yeah, <laughs> just like the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, of course, um, the conflict in Afghanistan writ large is, in, is inseparable from great power rivalry in the sense that um, after the Soviet, the, the Soviet invasion, which you know, we can see from the, from the Politburo records of 1978 and 1979, is best understood as a kind of defensive invasion, not a not an offensive Cold War invasion. They, they had fostered an Afghan Communist Party that they'd lost control of, and they decided that they needed to get in there and fix their, their revolution. So they came in, and then in the response, the indigenous uh, Afghan rebellion against the Soviet occupation and, and the rule by the Afghan uh, government that they sponsored, um, we uh, not only collaborated in a Cold War uh, covert action with ISI and um, uh, Saudi Arabia. We also collaborated with China, who supplied uh, weapons that were part of the covert action. And so China, in that era of the Soviet Union, saw um, proxy conflict in Af Afghanistan as as part of its way to contain uh, its its concern its rivalry with the Soviet Union. All right. So post Cold War, post 2001, I think when we went in, when when if you, if you imagine the scene in the Panjshir Valley where the first CIA uh, team goes in to start building the, the plan to overthrow the Islamic Emirate government starting in late September 2001, who do they find there? Essentially, they find the Russians, the Indians, and the Iranians, uh, because that was who was supporting the anti-Taliban uh, groups, the so-called you know, Council of the North, uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud and, and his allies. And, in fact, it was kind of a problem for the Americans because their, their operations books are, we don't work in areas where our allies are also working with the Iranians or, or the Russians. Uh, it's too compromising of our, of our work. Uh, but the Russians were there because uh, yeah, they weren't there as um, robustly as, I think, the Indians and Iranians, but they supplied helicopters and some arms, uh, partly to try to keep Taliban-inspired trouble off of their southern frontier. Um, and, uh, and so the, the Bonn Agreement that shaped 2001 and onwards politics was, um, a, a, was endorsed by the United States, Iran, and Russia, and India. And, uh, and, and then uh, as U.S. Um, uh, military forces grew and the Taliban insurgency revived, the calculations of both regional and and great power neighbors of Afghanistan shifted uh, from, you know, from, from era to era of the last 17 years. So, um, you know, the Chinese, uh, as their economy grew, as their uh, global aspirations grew, um, gradually envisioned economic corridors and economic projects in the region. 
um, but the kind of standard way to think about the way they saw us was, well, they were happy to free ride on our security operation uh, and, and, not, and were very cautious about getting involved themselves. Um, they, of course, Pakistan is their most important ally in the world, so um, they, they found Pakistan's um, conduct internally and politically as, as almost as maddening as the United States did, but they also valued that relationship in all, you know, in, and were willing to enable it uh, against, uh, you know, even in the face of uh, uh, dysfunction in, in Pakistani government and politics. They started to have their own counterterrorism concerns in Western China that informed some of their thinking, but never really in a strategic way. I think the standard uh, sense is that the Chinese very, very narrowly focused on their own agenda in the region and, and not willing to take risks to join in a great power kind of effort to stabilize Afghanistan. As to Russia, you know, there's lots of reports now about Russia, um, you know, aiding the Taliban, getting uh, involved in in political negotiations, they just hosted a meeting in Moscow, I guess, that the Americans attended. Um, you know, the sort of, I think the standard and probably the directionally correct way to see Russian uh, conduct in Afghanistan now is the same that you would see in many other parts of the world, which is what, whatever will mess up the United States, they will consider. <laughs> and uh, that, that could include, you know, sort of strange bedfellows uh, with, with the Taliban. Uh, DePaul and Steve, jump in any time that's appropriate. Um, <clears throat> Cynthia? Thank you. Cynthia Roberts, Salzman Institute. So I, I want to press anyone, uh, especially Steve Paul on the panel, but any of the rest of you as well, to think, to tell us more about your thoughts about the end game, in the sense if there's going to be an end game, starting with the two limited aims that you identified in the book that came out of the Obama review. If those are still the right limited names uh, to try and deal with not destabilizing Pakistan's nuclear weapons or Pakistan itself and finding a way that they remain secure, if there's any way we can contribute to that. And secondly, dealing with the return of uh, Al-Qaeda, you know, what are the prospects then for cutting a deal with the Taliban? Do we have to follow the military doctrine of winning or holding more, or regaining more lost ground to get there? Or would this administration perhaps ironically be prepared to accept less? And perhaps ironically, the president, you know, forcing uh, the actors that you so ably describe as having their own ideas about impl implementing policy uh, is perhaps now a more auspicious opportunity than ones we've had in recent years. So if you could comment on that, be great. Thank you. Well, I mean, there's certainly more activity and ambition around direct political negotiations with the Taliban, both by the Obama administration, I mean, the, the Trump administration and the Afghan government than we've seen. Um, there was, uh, you know, a notable interesting ceasefire earlier this year that galvanized a lot of attention in Afghanistan and was clearly the a product of some of the early back-channel negotiation that was going on and include, included the <coughs> Pakistanis. Um, you know, I think uh, there's, a, there's that odd sort of leverage that the president is exercising on this process, which is rooted in his well-known instinct, uh, which he has articulated in public, I think even including when he made his policy speech about a policy that was mostly continuity in August 2017, when he said, as you know, my instinct is to get out of this war, <laughs> and, and I don't think it's winnable. And uh, then he accepted the advice of H.R. McMaster and, and Jim Mattis and others to, to not, uh, to stay the course and to just be tougher and tougher on Pakistan. You know, there was this perception left over from military experience that the rules of engagement weren't loose enough, that we needed to drop more bombs and be more aggressive, and he endorsed all of that. But what's become clear this year is that somehow he is signaling quite uh, clearly to his own um, cabinet that um, he, he wakes up a lot of mornings regretting having taken this advice and he wants, uh, he wants a path to, to the exits. And that has kind of galvanized uh, part of this, uh, this negotiation strategy and uh, 
So you have the appointment of Zal Khalilzad, a lot of contacts uh, going on. And um, so what are the prospects for that? They're, you know, they were always unknowable, but at least there will be a, a, another a round to, um, and another round to kind of test um, both what um, the, the United States might be willing to accept by way of compromise, what the Taliban might be willing to accept um, as uh, whether they would be willing to enter into uh, politics um, uh, in some way or another, or to develop a political, a substantial political um, strategy to complement their revolutionary uh, military strategy, which would be um, not necessarily, you know, I, I, I don't think that it's all about war or peace in these circumstances, right? So. You know, the, the Taliban can see models, lots of models, like Hezbollah, that has never surrendered its revolutionary aims, but has developed a, a political first strategy gradually over the years while not surrendering its arms. You know, uh, as a result, southern Lebanon is less violent than it would be, but it's still, it's still a nasty neighborhood. So, you know, all of these kinds of possibilities evolve from, from active political and diplomatic negotiations, and maybe, maybe we'll, we'll discover uh, what, what some of those possibilities are. And then the last thing I would say is, you know, it is difficult to imagine a sustainable reduction of violence in Afghanistan achieved through, at least even partially through negotiations and, and regional diplomacy, um, that, that Pakistan is not somehow uh, uh, accepting of. And there's, they're going to, if, if any, reduction of violence or um, transition of military activity into political activity evolves out of this, there are going to be spoilers. And uh, you don't want this, the spoiler to be um, driven by this, the, the policy of the Pakistani state or ISI. So um, that's another circle that has to be squared. Uh, so we can end by two. Let me take one last question, and then all three of you can uh, leave us with your final comments. Hi, uh, I'm Theo Milanopoulos, a PhD student here. Um, President Trump said in an interview last week that uh, he was relying, the reason that we were staying in Afghanistan is because he was relying on the experts saying that a withdrawal would lead to this kind of safe haven phenomenon from perpetuating. I'm curious to know how much um, the president's advice is diversified uh, among different kinds of, of advisors given how much the News reports suggest that civilians have been sidelined increasingly within the Pentagon, and how prepared the national security bureaucracy and the Pentagon itself would be for an order to precipitously withdraw um, if no negotiation or uh, um, continued stalemate persists. You know, it's hard to think contingently about these scenarios, it sounds, you know, there's a little bit of, uh, I, I would take it out of the Trump administration and just say that having watched civilian presidents of both political parties over um, the whole course of this conflict since 2001 and having watched civilian presidents in managing uh, the national security bureaucracy in, in other conflicts, including uh, uh, the Vietnam War, um, in general, it is very difficult for civilian presidents to get the military to precipitously withdraw from conflicts that it doesn't want to leave. And so there's always um, an argument, there's always um, a compromise, there's a, usually a, a, you know, a slope, um, and there's, there's various kinds of negotiations. So I think it's hard for me to imagine that, um, that even President Trump would not understand that it's not, um, uh, you know, light switch on, light switch off. What, what we have is a president who has increased the U.S. combat presence in Afghanistan from, you know, I don't know what it was exactly when it came in, 5,000, 8,000, uh, to about 16,000. And you could see, and there's, a, there's an enduring counterterrorism rationale uh, that he would hear lots of advice about throughout uh, the system if he were to decide to turn around and go the other way. But what would happen would not be everyone 
you know, getting in their APCs and driving out of Afghanistan on, on the same, you know, February morning, it would be another drawdown, an attempt to reset the counterterrorism mission around a lighter presence and hope for the best in terms of Afghan political uh, outcomes. I'd just suggest, by the way, never underestimate the difficulty of American political leaders in forthrightly accepting that they're uh, willing to accept defeat. Mm. Mm. Uh, the search for some other, mm -hmm. other <laughs> compromise, some other way out, some third way is overpowering. Mm. Uh, DePauli or Steve, any last words of wisdom? Um, I'll just say one quick point on, on Cynthia's. Um, question, because I think one of the things that's all interesting when we think about a potential deal with the Taliban is also to think about how that will reverberate back into Afghan domestic politics. And so there is a presidential election, at least theoretically, um, coming. And I think one of the char most interesting characters in the book for me to, to have reminded myself of is Zalmay Khalilzad. And I think he's a really interesting figure to sort of navigate those two different sets of negotiations and he actually understands those reverberations in a way that gives me some amount of comfort. <laughs> well, just to, I'll add another quick word in response to Cynthia's question on the prognosis at this point. I mean, the, the war has been stalemated for years with, with little or no negotiating progress. I think the odds are, are strong that the stalemate is going to break soon. It could break badly or it could break well. And part of the prospect for it breaking well is the danger that it could break badly. <laughs> the, the presidential election in Afghanistan that's scheduled for the spring could be a, a state-ending catastrophe right, if it's not handled well. The last election was handled very badly. The United States kind of knitted together with duct tape and bailing wire a compromise solution that's mostly drilled both sides into the ground with increasing bitterness. The lack of security sets up a situation in which it's easy for either side in this upcoming election to conclude that the result was unfair and biased against them. You know, the, and if this election fails, and if the Afghan intelligence service police and army split, and they're all deeply factionalized, so, and factionalized along the same lines as the political contest is likely to be contested over, then you get collapse. And Syria is now an interesting model. Highly salient, really visible, emotionally gripping for all parties involved. And track two diplomacy that's been going on for over a year now uh, with the Taliban has at least reported that the Taliban keep referring to the Syria model hmm as a concern for the future of the country, that if the country breaks up into something like Syria and there's outside engagement on the scale they increasingly see from Russia, from Iran, and the emergence of a massive threat to their own position in the form of the you know, so-called Islamic State in Afghanistan, that the Taliban increasingly, so some claim, sees the prognosis in that scenario not as being some quick Taliban version 2.0 restoration, mm -hmm. but as resetting the clock for civil war and instability in the country to another 10 years out. And in that setting, plus the resolution of a succession crisis in the Taliban right after Mullah Omar died, and that was finally leaked, and then we killed his successor, no Taliban leader could seriously negotiate, right, because it would harm their internal position vis-a-vis -vis rivals within the, the factional structure of the Taliban. You could argue that that succession crisis has sort of sorted itself out. The United States has quit at least for a while shooting ourselves in the foot with calendar-based fixed withdrawal dates that give the Taliban a constant incentive to see if the Afghan security forces split after the next drawdown window the United States imposes on itself transpires. That change, by the way, occurred under Obama. It was not a decision that the Trump administration made. The Obama administration ended the calendar withdrawals before they left office. You combine these things, and you get this, this par perhaps paradoxical conclusion that the growing danger of radical instability might empower progress in the negotiations, given some other relatively favorable changes in background conditions that have been ongoing at the same time. 
but but that, that's a, that's both an opportunity and real peril. Right? If, if progress doesn't get made fairly quickly, and if some coordination between the domestic political process in Afghanistan leading up to elections and the tempo and direction of whatever negotiating strategy is adopted aren't coordinated in some way, you could end up getting the, the catastrophe before you can reap the benefit that fear of catastrophe might enable. Thank you all. Thank you.